Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joanne Rupenthal. I am one of the supervisors here at the Chetwin Detachment. Uh, currently, Chetwin has a uh, sergeant running the detachment, and then we have two corporals and then uh, eight constables. Um, one constable is dedicated to the First Nations policing section, which deals with um, Soto and Moberly Lake reserves. In um, our detachment, we also have Victim Services, and uh, Victim Services is a, is a provincial program, and it can um, stem from the community or from the RCMP. Chetwin and small detachments, and also big detachments, I guess, um, sometimes have Victim Services within their detachment, and we have Leanne Odette as our coordinator for Victim Services. Uh, it's a paid position for uh, the community and uh, sometimes there's volunteers that can um, help her um, run her program and uh, I'm gonna try to get Leanne to come up here to talk about her program in a minute All right. uh, <laughs> I'm glad you did that before you came <laughs> yes. um, we we deal with um, the population of Chetwin our jurisdiction goes all the way out to Ground Birch so just before the Ground Birch store on Highway 97, um, I think it's 273 is our cutoff road. We go all the way up to uh, near Cameron Lake on Highway 29 towards Hudson the Hope. And we go just about to Powder King on Highway 97 uh, towards Prince George. And then down uh, Tumbler Ridgeway, we're just about near, um, what's that park called? Uh, Gwillem Park. So our area is quite vast and um, most of our policing is generated within town. Uh, our rural placing, uh, policing is mostly stem, like the type of calls are usually stemmed from uh, thefts from motor vehicles or from houses and occasionally um, some violent offenses like assaults or domestics and, and that kind of thing. Usually the rural places, they seem to be um, I don't want to say more community oriented, but they do look after their neighbors more um, because of the remoteness. We do try to get out there as much as we can uh, when the school buses are dropping um, the students off, just because there is a increase of people being very impatient and passing the school buses when they have their flashing lights on and stuff like that. So we try to enforce that as much as we can. The amount of RCMP officers currently working at a specific time is sometimes limited. Sometimes you have two or three working, sometimes you only have one. And it depends on if we're short staffed or if um, what is happening at the detachment. Some might be delegated to go out to the, uh, to the reserves to work um, because there's something currently happening there. So then that would leave one member working in the detachment. Plus you have your uh, NCOs, like a sergeant or a corporal assisting the constables out. The services that we have in Chetwin that uh, the RCMP can um, bring in, uh, we have a police dog that we can bring in from Dawson Creek and Fort St. John. And sometimes Prince George will uh, allow us to have their dog as well. But the commute for the dog is obviously driving time for him and his handler so three and a half hours from Prince George is quite a long time to pick up a, a scent if we normally we would uh, use a police dog to pick up a scent for uh, impaired driving if somebody takes off um, if there's a collision uh, injuries uh, b and e's robberies that kind of thing where a suspect has fled on foot recently um, we had an incident where we used specialized avalanche dogs to search for a missing person um, that was caught up in an avalanche uh, in the area. So our dogs are very specialized um, in each region. We can also take from uh, Alberta detachments as well if our BC detachments are unavailable for their dogs. The RCMP also has access to helicopters and planes that we utilize as well for major cases. And they stem from Prince George and um, a lower mainland area. So they're available whenever we need them. Um, again, for a high incident case file, we might utilize 
um, resources down in the lower mainland and they need to be shipped up here quickly so then the airplane or the helicopter will um, be flying them up here. It's a great uh, resource that we have with in-house but we can also use uh, private sector as well if that um, happens to be the case when our own services are unavailable. Uh, what else can I tell you about? We also, um, each member that uh, is in the Chetwin detachment has certain duties that they do in conjunction with taking calls that come in. And a lot of our members are assigned to specific schools and they are required to attend the school monthly and whenever the school kind of needs them. There are two specialized members that teach a drug awareness program in Chetwin called the D.A.R.E. program. And every year we go and we uh, teach the grade fives and sixes um, how to resist drugs and alcohol. And they learn coping skills about peer pressure, self-esteem, um, what does pressure look like, how to resist friends who push them into uh, negative behavior, as well as um, just empowering them to make good choices. And that is a, a province-funded program that an RCMP member is trained to administer. We also have uh, members that kind of do things on their own time to help the community out as well. Our First Nations Policing Officer, Constable Cruz, uh, has um, helped coordinate a basketball uh, team at the high school. Uh, originally it was to help First Nations students to look towards some recreational activities to help with building self-esteem, making them more involved in the community. And it kind of morphed into a lot of other um, ethnic students to participate as well. So they travel all over, um, I think, the Peace region t for basketball games and stuff. I believe their record isn't very good right now, but you know, if practice makes perfect, I guess, that it should uh, come along maybe next year or the year after that. So new groups that are forming. Um, I started a baseball team a couple years ago. Um, my son likes to play hardball baseball, and uh, there wasn't uh, a team like that here in Chetwin. So being a good mom that I am, I started a team for him, and it's been going on for four years. and. Uh, we take ages from 11 to 16, and we play other uh, northern areas like uh, Fort St. John, Dawson Creek. Tumbler Ridge might actually have a team this year, so we'll be expanding out to Tumbler Ridge as well. And uh, so again, um, not only are we police officers policing the community, but we're also uh, citizens that uh, fill a void that we uh, sometimes find when we enter into a community and we try to help out as much as we can. A lot of the members also volunteer their time to help with the local hockey team, um, volunteering their skills there. And sometimes we participate in school programs, um, le reading programs or uh, any other type of program that the principal or the staff wishes us to participate in. The school is, uh, are very committed to the RCMP and us to them. So it's, it's a two-way street if they find that they <coughs> are needing uh, members to come in and talk about a certain issue that's popping up. We will go and talk about cyberbullying. We'll talk about bullying. Um, we'll talk about um, girl topics, boy topics, anything that they kind of need. We have uh, members that are kind of trained and we can download programs that we have available to us to bring to the community as well. A uh, couple of things that we've done with the youth. Uh, we've started a positive ticket enforcement um, program with them. So we solicit local businesses and to donate um, coupons or services and we hand them out to citizens, mo mainly youth, when they do something good in the community like pick up garbage or they do make a good choice, um, wearing your helmet at the skateboard park, that kind of thing too, just to empower them that people do recognize that they're, they're doing good not just every time that they do something bad, the police are involved or the parents are involved or anything like that. So again, we look to see how we can better the community uh, whenever we come into uh, towns. And these are the programs that sometimes the skills of a member brings in from another detachment and we utilize it that way. 
A uh, couple other things that we have going here as well. Um, we're hoping to start up a restorative justice program here in the community. And the restorative justice program is a provincial based program and it's more or less trying to uh, divert people that come into contact with the RCMP in a negative way and divert them from the courts. Uh, the court system is very clogged with cases that are repetitive and or um, not very serious like petty crime, um, minor thefts, mischief like damaging somebody's window or slashing tires that kind of thing. Sometimes we find that the court system isn't very um, conducive to changing somebody's behavior because you're not really making the person accountable. All you're doing is having them show up, a lawyer or somebody else talks on their behalf, they say they did it or they didn't do it and a trial may or may happen, but they don't really get to own their actions. And so the restorative justice program is a, a way for them to um, talk about their guilt um, in a non-confrontational way with people that are supporting their um, path of rehabilitation and also allows them or allows the victims to confront the person that has harmed them in a non-confrontational way. Uh, it's very guided. There's um, facilitators that are trained to do it and it's had a lot of success in other uh, communities that I've been in and I am a trained facilitator so I'm hoping that um, we can get enough volunteers to come forward to help facilitate the program because without the volunteers coming in and donating their time to help uh, the program out then the program kind of falls so that's one of the things that we'll be advertising in the near future is hopefully having some volunteers come forward uh, and also carry forward the message that you know we are there to help the community it sometimes um, repetitive offenders might do well in a restorative justice program as opposed to always going through the court system because obviously it's not working if they're always showing up in the court system so why not try something different and you just never know it's uh, been very successful with First Nations um, policing they have sometimes their own uh, restorative justice where they have um, a mentor in the community that helps guide say a youth and uh, then follows that youth through the path of whatever their consequence might be and again it just ties them again to the community instead of being anonymous and doing mischief it just ties them again to being accountable uh, success is all about accountability i feel and um, whether it's a little bit or a lot it takes a lot of um, courage to own up to your mistakes and the shame and guilt that comes from it when you don't um, perpetuates a lot of the drug activity that we have out there unfortunately. The other type of program that um, we have is victim services and um, hoping Leanne can come up or I can talk about victim services she can just give you a, a little brief overview of what uh, the stats are in Chetwin and Hudson Hope because she takes care of Hudson Hope as well and the type of resources that she allows. Go ahead. Do you want me to do it from here? Sure. That's good. I'll just stay. I'll be a little less formal than you do. Okay. Sounds good. So I do work closely with um, all the members of the RCMP. My most of my referrals come <laughs> come from uh, the police. They can come from other services in town too or self-referrals if people need help on their own and they can seek me out. Um, my office is in the detachment. Um, I would say I'm between 8 and 11 new clients a month. Um, yeah. They, and lots carry over. The whole entire year and a, year and a bit that I've been there, um, I have some of the same clients. And now we're just getting to the court process of their file. So I kind of follow them along through this whole journey. Um, lots of ups and downs and changes and depending on what their needs are and everybody's needs are so different um, from counseling in town and out of town because some people don't want to seek local counselors just more for their privacy or for their own feelings. And um, I do, I have attended calls 
more domestic um, calls. Um, taking clients up to the hospital if needed. Um, transporting for court. Uh, we do a lot through court process, um, just prepping them for court um, to take a little bit of that fear away of having to go onto the stand. Um, and then accompanying to court, usually the bigger files are in Dawson, so that's usually where we spend our days for court. Um, I have been attending the career fairs and the health fairs with the RCMP. What else? I work four days a week, I'm on call the rest of the time. So if any anything's needed, I'm there. Um, am I missing something, Joe? No, I think that's good. The, one of the great assets of victim services is that um, unfortunately, sometimes the RCMP members are busy and they can't spend the, the time that a victim or somebody that is um, grieving through a sudden loss uh, to spend that time. So sometimes we feel that we don't, um, it's very impersonal because we don't get to have that one-on-one, -on -one, but unfortunately we have to investigate the crime portion of whatever the file may be and so victim services is a great asset for us because um, specifically Leanne like she said she gets she's on call so she'll get a call out at 3 in the morning and sometimes she'll attend a house with us to deal with say somebody that was um, assaulted by their husband or uh, somebody suddenly passed and they're left all by themselves. And uh, obviously there's a lot of great resources here in Chetland to help with the aftermath, but Leanne's the first contact that we would provide the victim. And she is, kind of stays with them until they no longer need her anymore. So somebody arrives or support is there and, and then just connecting them after that with the local services with the outreach program or the safe house or um, any anything they might need. Yeah, drug and alcohol counseling, yeah. anything like that. Yeah. Um, also uh, with kids, children, she's uh, she has resources for that as well if your child is going through a divorce and um, acting out and there's some behavioral issues at school and we attend because there's some issues with uh, acting out or bringing weapons in, say um, uh, calls for help, that kind of thing. We can re refer the family to victim services and then they can be supported that way as well. Uh, a lot of times people feel like it's a, it's a problem they need to solve in-house in their own privacy, but they are unsure of what the resources are. And unfortunately, the RCMP is called when people are at their most vulnerable and we get an insight of what's going on and sometimes with our training we we uh, we miss it and we often offer victim services soon after and then she'll pick up on something through a conversation because sometimes they they don't want to talk to us they there's a barrier there's a maybe a cultural barrier and so Leanne is there to um, just listen and be non-judgmental and uh, you know then after you know many months or whatever is the if the person feels more empowered they can come talk with us and then we can reopen the investigation so it's it's not a one and done kind of thing it's an ongoing kind of support that we have within the community and, and that kind of thing yeah thanks Joe that's all you did yeah thank you yeah <laughs> um, the other um, program that I um, am trying to start up here in Shetland and uh, I brought in my friend Shailene Rao, she's a nurse, <coughs> uh, is a sexual assault protocol team and what we're trying to establish here in Shetland and maybe it might spill out to other northern communities that are small like ours is to um, utilize a, a team of professionals that can help with when there's a sexual assault. And I, when I talk about sexual assault, it's primarily females that are the victims, but there are males that do uh, become victims as well. But uh, primarily the percentage is victims. Sometimes um, a sexual assault is not uh, reported for various reasons. It could be that the victim is blaming them herself 
for the assault. It could be that there's a cultural barrier that they do not trust the system and therefore they're not going to uh, participate in any type of investigation. And sometimes it could be that they just don't realize that they could report it. Um, it could be somebody that they know. It could be a family member. It could be that they were at a party and they were intoxicated and it just happened and they didn't know. They thought it was consequences of too much drinking. Whatever it may be, we find that there is a lack of service for these victims here in Chetwin. And so my, my uh, role in the time that I'm here is to try to start a team of professionals, healthcare professionals, um, victim services, community outreach people, um, even businesses that have a need to want to volunteer their time in helping uh, with a worthwhile initiative like this. And what we're kind of looking for is if, if the victim cannot get services here in Chetwin, where can they get services? And instead of trying to fight the system to get the services here, we can transport them to other areas that have the services. So right now, Fort St. John is the only hospital that does sexual assault exams. And to us, an hour and a half drive is a little bit too long for a victim to uh, be by themselves and deal with that kind of incident. So what we would like to bring together is possibly people that could um, volunteer to drive uh, the person to the hospital, um, to stay with them at the hospital, to drive them back to their community. It's, unfortunately, the sexual assault exam itself is a long process, so it's not a couple hours at the hospital. It could be, um, you know, up to five hours, and it just depends on how busy the hospital staff is. You have to be have you have to have a trained doctor to do the exam, because there is a court component to gathering evidence. That's not to say when you do report a sexual assault, it'll always go to court. It's just, it's a stage and it's, um, and after the report is done, it might just sit. The victim doesn't want to go any further and that's fine. It's, the victim has ultimate control, um, which is good because it'll empower them because they obviously didn't have control in the first place when it happened. And so there's a lot of hoops that we have to go through to get the, this team rolling and We've been meeting with the mayor and council, uh, Northern Health uh, officials, with um, personal nurses as well that want to help out. And uh, some have offered to do the training themselves, but unfortunately, there is a certain criteria that has to be established and maintained within a year for that person to still be qualified to do sexual assault exams. We don't get a lot of sexual assaults in Chetwin. But again, we don't know if it's not, it's just not being reported. Um, so in order for the nurse to keep up their training, they have to have at least between six and 10 sexual assault exams per year in order to keep it. So it, it's just not feasible to train them that way. So our plan is to go with plan B, which is to drive the, re the person to the resources. And um, so it's a work in progress. I've been dealing with it for almost three and a half years. So we've just now come into like the planning stage of what we're gonna do now instead of going through all the research. And so we're looking for, again, people to volunteer their time. Um, obviously, if you're dealing with victims, there would be a criminal background check um, to be uh, examined first to see if um, we can entrust the person with a person to drive them but having said that there's a great amount of people here in the community that want to help and they just don't know how and sometimes it's just a couple hours here and there that could be making a change for somebody's life and I think that's great um, yeah and that's pretty well a nutshell of what's <clears throat> happening here in Chatwin I mean um, I, I've made arrangements to be on the radio uh, more often to talk about monthly initiatives that the RCMP is going to be taking. Um, in December, I uh, started an initiative of going out to the businesses. I went to West Fraser, talked to the employees about impaired driving and how it impacts the businesses. Uh, having an employee without a driver's license because of a mistake that they did and then driving a company car 
that company car unfortunately gets impounded and therefore you lose a resource in one of these businesses. So a couple, um, several businesses have participated in that in December, but the program goes um, all throughout the year. So it's not just around drinking and driving festivities. Um, drinking and driving is a national problem. It happens daily. So um, we're out there trying to find different ways to be proactive so that we don't have all the deaths that would happen or occur. Uh, the other initiatives that we have are auto thefts, um, as well as uh, just be getting the community informed of certain things that the Motor Vehicle Act uh, imposes. And up here in the north, sometimes it's the north and we get away with a lot of things, but uh, it's not uh, a punitive thing, it's more of an educational thing. And so we, the more education somebody has, the more better choices that they make, in my opinion. So that's another thing that we're going to be starting is uh, partnering up with the media here in Shetland and, and trying to get more involved that way as well. So, any questions? Actually, I have a question. Sure. Um, your restorative justice program. Yes. Um, I think it's a great idea. And you said the volunteers, what would that look like for a volunteer? Like what would, have, what would you expect from a volunteer in that program? So a volunteer <clears throat> can have many functions. So it could be a mentor in the program. So somebody that is, uh, would have to be screened to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're gonna be dealing with children or with high risk youth mm -hmm. um, or adults. And so it could be just somebody that's a mentor that meets with the person once a week to make sure that they do their community service or whatever the, the punitive or the consequences. And, um, or it could be somebody that runs the, the, the session itself. So somebody that's a, a facilitator that coordinates with the, the victim's family and the offender's family. And then pretty well everything is done behind the scenes. And then when you come to the, to the meeting, it's pretty well, okay, let's talk about what happened. How did that affect you? What were you thinking? Okay, the victim, how do you feel about what was said? That kind of thing. And then we already kind of know what the consequences are gonna be going in. And then it's just how is that gonna set it up? So if, for example, somebody was abusive to a dog, then maybe there might be some kind of volunteer work with animals. And then we would get the bylaw officer involved or or if there's an SCACA or some animal shelter that's in the area, then we would try to coordinate that the person would do some community service hours there. That kind of thing. Thanks. Joanne, just wondering about the victim services. Is it funded through the RCMP or is it a separate department? And, and what kind of stability is there in that funding? Did you want to talk about it? Go ahead. No, you can. I, my funding is through the district. It's through the district. Yeah. Okay. Um, stability? I, I think it's good. <laughs> Do you as much as anything else, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep, you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> I guess the question is, is there, is, there, is there any threat to, you know, reduce services in the community? Those kind of concerns. I, I don't see it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, like Hudson Hope, uh, Leanne deals well, with Hudson Hope, Hope yeah. so they don't have a victim services there. Uh, so Leanne does the referrals from Chetwin. She'll go up to victim services, mm -hmm. uh, speak to whoever needs to be spoken to there. 10 calls with Hudson Hope members, that kind of thing. They had a recent drowning mm -hmm. um, last year. So Leanne was called out for that and, and helped with the family support and, and that kind of thing and ongoing support because mm -hmm. unfortunately he was in town right away. Um, and if, if so happens the victim services position is vacant, then Dawson Creek then takes over for us as well. So there's always that support. Summer, um, Fort St. John has their own victim services as well. So sometimes our victim comes into Chetwin, but lives out in Fort St. John. So then we would put the referral out to Fort St. John and then they would hook up with that victim services mm -hmm. worker there. So yeah. yeah. But the RCMP, uh, Leanne's position is funded by the municipality. But uh, we provide the the workspace for her, so uh, that's why she's inside oh, the detachment. Yeah, it's nice yes. to be close, right? Yeah. Close yeah. to them. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion that goes on. <coughs> it's just nice to be in the same office. And yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. And the other thing that Leanne does as well, which doesn't go recognized very often, is that she's a support for us. 
Uh, sometimes we go to a lot of calls that take a toll on us. Uh, we can only be strong for so long. And there's a lot of PTSD in first responders. And Leanne is a very good resource for us to just sit on our couch and talk about stuff or personal stuff that's kind of interfering with the way that we're doing our work and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, the RCMP in itself is trying to be very proactive with mental health. And so having somebody that's uh, like Leanne and her personality is very comforting for us to have in the house. Good. Yeah. Who supports you? They do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they do. Do you have a lot of holidays? I do have great holidays. Because <laughs> you're going to need them too. I do get lots of holidays. They're great for me too. Um, you do bounce things off or concerns or fears or... Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's not so formal, and then sometimes you do get into the deeper discussions where my door gets closed and yeah. we sit on the couch, like you know, sit on the couch, and yeah, it's good. It's a good partnership. Good. Yeah. Awesome. It's good to hear. Because outside of that, that's that's your pod of support, right? Because of the confidentiality, you can't go home and express how you feel about things, and so it is important to have, yeah, the office. You bet. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, sir? Would, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask another one. Uh, yeah. As far as crime in the Ch the Chatham community, like property crime is probably higher than one of the, the bigger ones, and maybe alcoholism and drug abuse in the town. But do you see those stats increasing or leveled off or dropping, possibly? Or where do you think the community is going? Well, I think. It's, it's hard, like even with the D.A.R.E. program and, and teaching children as age, uh, ages 10, 11 and 12, how to deal with stress and, and peer pressure and everything, we're trying to get them to think, um, if they're in a dysfunctional home, we're trying to think, let them think of a different way, but unfortunately when they go back to their dysfunctional home, those behaviors are reinforced, right? So. The type of things that we try to engage the youth in to where it's very limited. So it needs a, a whole community, a partnership with the parents and everybody to raise these kids to feel accountable and, and uh, to feel that they're worthy of good attention and um, to aspire beyond the, the, even the community itself. It's not, there's nothing wrong with staying in your community once you graduate, but uh, there's a whole big world out there, right? And we've given them confidence to try to take risks um, and find ways of dealing when the risk doesn't um, turn out the way that they want, good coping skills on that kind of front. Then we're passing those behaviors on to another generation, which is great. The, so when you have parents that don't reinforce those kind of things, then you're perpetuating the problem. And the, unfortunately, it doesn't matter where you are, bigger centers, Vancouver Island, up here in the north, it's always the same problem that comes down to drugs and alcohol. Um, that's not, probably 99, between 90 and 99% of our job is alcohol and drug related addiction issues because you have people stealing to feed their addiction, you have people committing mischief because they're high or, or uh, on, on alcohol or drugs, um, domestics, come from poor coping skills and unable to deal with the pressures that are going on. Sometimes that stems from uh, drugs and alcohol as well. You have um, really violent offenses, sexual assault, um, assault causing bodily harm, murders, all stem from drug and alcohol use, right? Would you say since the legalization of marijuana, there's been a change in statistics as far as... Uh, mm -mm. No. Okay. No, and that's not to say that I support the legalization yeah, of yeah. marijuana. Um, I think it's it's uh, education thing again uh, because alcohol is has been legal for very many many years but yet you still find a lot of alcoholics right so again it's just an education thing and to recognize if you do have a problem to get help right away before it becomes uh, an addiction issue where you, right. you're unable to break through your denial yeah good thank you Awesome. Well, thank you so Great. much for coming out. Fantastic. <coughs> Everybody has a little blue ticket. 
So one of our um, our, our luncheon, who, our uh, provider is Crazy Beans Bistro. And not only does she provide lunch, but she also donates a $25 gift certificate as a door prize each month. Sweet. So. <laughs> That's my number. Pull your number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a blue ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Last three numbers are 938. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, someone called <laughs> 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 Bingo. Yeah. Everybody got your cards tonight? <laughs> <laughs> you are. Well, thank you. Thanks. So th again, thank you so much Crazy. for coming out. Um, <laughs> it's really great to hear about the restorative justice program. In my past life, I worked in community newspapers for 25 years, a reporter, editor, publisher, yada, yada, yada. So I covered a couple of communities down in uh, the Kootenays that brought in restorative justice, and it was very, very successful. It was an absolutely wonderful program so I'm really happy to mm. see that good door opening to come to the community yeah mm. and for our victim services it takes a really special person to hold that position you take a lot on your shoulders yeah. and your community so thank, thank you. you so much for stepping thank in and you. offering that to our community So they slapped on the cuffs, and jail time was their bluff. I walked away with a $500 fine, cause it was only two grammars, not enough dope for the slammer. So I kept on cruising down the line. Sue St. Marie, look what you've done to me. Such a shame that we had to meet this way. And I guess I learned my lesson, I suppose I'll count my blessings, but it's safe to say I won't be back again. And when I left the border, my fuse was getting shorter, I went back to the Canadian side of town, hoping things would get better, but the streets were getting wetter, and the Sioux kept on dragging me down. And on Wellington and Bruce, that's where all hell broke. Okay, it's, uh, it's nice here in January and it's a brand new new year and uh, we'd like to thank you as the audience for participating in this great event. Uh, the great event is, uh, is uh, sponsored by uh, Shell and uh, Soto and Chatwin. So we're all uh, participating in this and recognizing uh, some great athletes in our world. This being Chatwin. So I'd like to thank uh, our committee for uh, putting this together, mainly, uh, where is she? She's hiding? <laughs> Ellen, thank you very much for putting this together, and uh, Rudy and Soto, thank you very much. And uh, right, right now with uh, everything going on, 
uh, this is this is a team that we're uh, we're involved with right now live. Uh, but the first uh, NHL player that we have right here to my right, Dodie Wood. Thank you, Dodie. Sharks, San Jose. Yeah. Okay, and here we are with the gold medal, Team Canada. Uh, Denny Morrison. Yeah. And and uh, right now that uh, is playing, I believe in uh, Chicago, is it tonight? Uh, Derek England and uh, representing the England family, Pam, the mother of Derek. Thank you very much. And re representing Shell, Jen. Thank you very much. And Rudy Soto, thank you very much for doing all this. And we have some stuff here for them. If you just want to hand me this. Yeah, thank you. There you go, Pam. This is for Derek and the family. And Denny, thank you very much for coming down. It's uh, awesome that we get to meet you in person. And Dodie, thank you for being a great citizen of Chatwin and a representative, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. All right, I'm Linda Morgan for Peace FM and Chet TV and I am here with Dodie Wood, former NHLer, uh, most well known for uh, being an enforcer on the San Jose Sharks. And we're here live at Skate in the Park in uh, Chetwind at Spirit Park. How's it going today? Very good. It was a nice day. Oh, yeah. Perfect weather for this, for sure. Now, um, you're originally from Chetwind, and you got your start at the Chetwind District Minor Hockey Association before going on to uh, the NHL and being part of the San Jose Sharks. Uh, how would you say your time in the Chetwind Hockey Association helped prepare you for the NHL? Uh, when you grow up, I, I had good coaching. Uh, all, obviously, all the coaches are volunteers, but... Uh, like we had real good coaching going up and, and all my friends were competitive. Actually, I think seven of us went off our, our Bantam team to go play junior. So we were a very competitive team and we were well coached and it just grooms you uh, uh, for the next level. Absolutely. Now you were an enforcer for the NHL. Do you think the role of an enforcer is still necessary in the NHL today? Uh, I say yes, but I, with all the concussion stuff right now, it, it would be hard to say what the enforcer uh, would be like nowadays uh, compared to 10 years ago, but uh, that's something that the NHL will have to deal with. Uh, players will stick up for other players, so you don't need a designated guy, but uh, with all the concussion stuff now, there it's a 50% battle what side you're on, right? Are you for concussions or against them? Absolutely. And what's it like being recognized by your own hometown? Oh, this is awesome. It, it's a good turnout. I, Actually a little nervous. I thought I had to skate, so I had to. I hid my skates at my brother's place, and they found it. So they brought them down for me, but I'm still not going to get out there. <laughs> All right. And who do you think has the best chance at bringing home the Stanley Cup this year? Oh, I got to. I got to say Las Vegas. But I was cheering for Washington if they're hearing me over there. But it don't look like they're paying much attention. All right, I'm Linda Morgan for Peace FM and Chet TV, and standing beside me is Olympian Denny Morrison. How's it going today? Oh, it's it's great. This is beautiful. It's uh, really amazing what can happen when the community comes together and uh, gets together something awesome like this. I started as a speed skater here in Chetwind, and um, it's just so, so cool to see like something like this. It seems small, but it can do so much for a community. And I wouldn't be standing here with this jacket on and this medal around my neck if it wasn't for. Uh, starting out small here in Chetwin and dreaming big. And that's how it all goes, right? Absolutely, yes. And speaking of the gold medal, which you won in Vancouver in 2010 for men's team pursuit, what was it like standing on the top of the podium and representing Canada? 
Well, the top of the podium, that's the pinnacle, right? That's what I dreamed of my entire life. It was, I think it was in grade five, I was 10 years old when I said, I want to skate at the Olympics and win a gold medal one day. And it took 10 years to, to achieve that dream. And uh, to be on your home soil and your home province, the whole country, the whole world is watching and achieve your dreams in single Canada with your family in the crowd and your friends and family watching on TV and the prime minister was in the crowd. That's a moment that uh, you don't forget anytime quick. And uh, I hope I can re replicate that in uh, other areas of my life later down the road too. Absolutely. And of course, you've had some setbacks in your career. You were involved in a motorcycle accident. You had a debilitating stroke and you were able to make a recovery and compete again last year at the Pyeongchang Olympics. What can you tell me about your recovery? Like what helped you the most? Well, yeah, the recovery, the, the motorcycle crash, it broke my femur. And as a speed skater, that's like a pretty big setback and that's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, but I mean, it goes back as far as starting here in Chetwind, right? You learn to skate outdoors in the cold and you deal with some adversity from a young age and then you deal with that same adversity through sport and it teaches you just to keep bouncing back, to keep getting up when you fall down and to keep uh, fighting to achieve your goals. And in some ways, when I got back after the motorcycle crash and I skated on the World Cups and I got ahead of stroke and I got back and I made it to the Olympics, it was getting to the those fourth Olympics. I never got a medal to wear around my neck like this. But just getting there was a big achievement and that's an achievement that you can't show off in the way of like an Olympic medal but it's because of a lifetime of doing that and getting back up when you get hit down that uh, that's what got me there and it's uh, something I'm very very proud of. And what do you remember most about growing up in uh, Chatwind? Well one of the things I remember in Chatwind is uh, doing parent taught skate at the rec center over here and my mom would take me and I would have to jump the blue line and jump the red line and jump the blue line and that's one of my biggest um, memories from Shetland. One other memory I just thought of was my brother. I wanted to learn to ride my bike when I was two or three years old, and my brother could ride his bike. And so he tied a rope from his bike to my bike, and then we took off down the the driveway. And he's like, "Yeah, you're doing it, man." And then he turned really quick and stopped, and then I kept going straight and flew off. And that was the first time in my life I had to deal with adversity and I had to be gritty and get up and like wipe the dirt from my face and uh, by the end of that summer I was riding a bike no problem so <laughs> and what would you say is next for you in your career well next I'm uh, rehabbing this knee surgery I just had to uh, fix that up and at the same time I'm going back to university now and hoping to become a medical doctor here in the north and some of the rural communities possibly in British Columbia and revisit my roots full circle <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today Morgan for Peace FM and Chet TV and I'm at the Skate in the Park event here at Spirit Park in Chetwin and standing beside me is Derek Englund's brother-in-law Terry Smith and his nephew Leland Smith. How's it going today guys? Good. good. Really good. Good. It's beautiful out. Good time for skate. Nice weather. Absolutely. Now the whole town was cheering for Derek last year when the Vegas Golden Knights made it into the Stanley Cup Finals. Not only was it their first time in the Finals, but it was their first year at it as a team. So what can you tell me about what it's like seeing someone in your family make it so far? Uh, it was pretty exciting. It, we were uh, all pumped. The whole family was, and uh, our opportunity to go down and see him play in the finals was an experience for sure. It was awesome. Excellent. Now, what are some of your memories of Derek? Uh, just having fun. Well, we watched him, and uh, when first time I saw him was in the WHL in Moose Jaw as a warrior, and uh, yeah, ever since then it was we was game on. We loved watching him. It was pretty exciting. Cool, cool. And does the rest of the family love hockey as much as Derek does? Uh, his mom probably is a bit more of a fanatic than Derek is. She loves the sport. So we all love it. And what do you think are his odds of winning the cup this year? Uh, pretty good. They're, they're up in the top. As long as they keep playing as hard as they are, and they did last year, they'll, they'll do good this year too. 
And what's it like to be here at Spirit Park and represent Derek in his hometown? Oh, I'm pretty excited that I got asked, and uh, yeah, it was it's good. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today.
and start playing. Dad would be on the fiddle, um, Joanne, Levine, uh, Joanne on the piano, Levine on the guitar. Now, I was usually pretty small then. So anyway, Clem, uh, he learned to play the piano and well, he plays lots of things. Yeah, no, whenever we get together it's just always been music. Uh, there's nothing like music. <laughs> Life wouldn't be the same without music. <laughs> <laughs> 